this is going to be the overview for First Thessalonians. And this small epistle has five chapters, 89 verses, and around 1,857 words. And the author is the Apostle Paul. The theme is how to live in preparation for the rapture. And each chapter, something significant is each chapter ends with a verse about the Lord's coming. For example, chapter 1 and verse 10, chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 13, chapter 4, 16 through 17, and chapter 5, 23. All those, they end with something about the Lord's coming. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 10 says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we're waiting for his Son from heaven. Now chapter 2, it says in chapter 2, in verse 19, it says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Chapter 3 and verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Chapter 4, uh, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Chapter 5 and verse 23 and the very god of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ so paul's talking a lot about prophecy <coughs> in this book and let's just get right into it first thessalonians 1 and verse 2 we give thee thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Uh, giving thanks for other Christians is foreign for a lot of Christians today, completely foreign to them. Most of them, if you're not in their little circle and club and uh, considered one of their people, gone to their school and like the same people they like and dress similar to them, uh, they just talk bad about you behind your back and hope you're dead at the end of the day. But Paul thanks God for the Thessalonians and makes mention of them in his prayers. And everybody would like a mention. If you can't think of a way to pray without ceasing, then just think of everyone you know and throughout the day give them a mention. Everybody wants a mention. Even lost people. Lost people all the time say to me, Remember me in your prayers. They know that they need help that nobody on this world can give them. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Notice Paul's attitude toward other saints. Instead of remembering their faults, consistently he's remembering their faith and their labor and their patience, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. You know, most Christians, they don't remember the good stuff about you. They just remember the bad stuff about you. Like if a Christian uh, has done all kinds of great work in his life, but he messed up in one way, what do they always remember? That one way he messed up. That one way he messed up gets mentioned more than all the good things that he ever did. Even like the uh, characters in the Bible, you look at David. What's something that gets mentioned about him? Just as much, probably even more so, a lot of times in his victory over Goliath is his sin with Bathsheba. You know, they want to remember the bad things. They want to remember their faults. Maybe it's because it feels makes people feel like they, they deep down they know they're wicked and they want to see good people fail to make themselves feel better. But Paul explains to them how he's not the only one who remembers the good stuff, but it's also in the sight of God. Everything you do is in the sight of God. He says, in the sight of God and our Father. So nothing's going unnoticed. He says in verse 8, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. 
not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. What a compliment from the Apostle Paul. Uh, this is obviously a very, a very good church. Uh, he says that the Thessalonians are sounding out the word of the Lord. And someone said that I use so many verses in these studies that it just becomes boring. And that they said I need to give my opinion more. And, you know, use more illustrations, maybe tell some more stories. And uh, I, I agree with them that I do need to do more of that stuff. But I'm trying to sound out the word of the Lord. And to be honest, I just, I honestly don't have any stories. I mean, I've not really had anything too exciting happen in my life, really. To have that many stories to incorporate into these studies. Because, you know, I'm doing, uh, other than, I've been kind of super busy lately. But in the past, I was doing like five a week. And if I just told stories throughout these things then you know i'm gonna run out of stories or have to say the same ones over and over and over and over again but to me the bible's not boring hearing that's my favorite kind of stuff is when somebody just gets in the bible exposits the chapter or a whole book of the bible that's what's exciting to me i'm not too big on the hearing stories and illustrations and all that i just want to sound out the word of the lord and there's so much Bible. This is another reason why I don't do too much of that. I don't spend much time with long introductions and my opinions and my thoughts or trying to be really funny. Because there's so much Bible that uh, I feel like I'll never get from cover to cover if I fill the whole 30 to 40 minutes of these lessons with stories and illustrations and my opinions. You got people that's been doing this stuff for 50 years and they've never made it from the cover to the back, from the front cover to the back cover of the Bible because they're filling the whole thing with stories and illustrations and things like that. And I'm not saying that's bad or nothing. That's just not for me to do myself. Um, my burden is to, I want to have a ministry that has uh, a lesson on each chapter of the Bible, each book of the Bible, and somebody, if they're interested in a certain chapter, they can come to this channel or the website, pull up that chapter, and have a, a ready thing ready to go there, just to tell them about what that chapter is about. So that's why I do this the way I do. And I just don't want to spend too much time just rambling and giving illustrations. In verse 9 it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The Thessalonians turned to God from idols. And this is used a lot by people to prove that if a person is truly saved, then he will turn from all his sins and live a godly lifestyle and, and finish that way. That's not true, though. Don't get me wrong. This is what we should do. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit to help us get victory over sin, and we can walk in the Spirit daily, and we should get rid of our pet sins, but a Christian can walk in the flesh throughout his Christian life and die that way. And then he gets to the judgment seat of Christ with nothing to show for himself. Now, we ought to turn from idols, and the Thessalonians did. They're a good church. They're so not the word of the Lord. Uh, Paul remembers all this good stuff about them. Their work of faith and labor of love. love. But however, remember, not every believer is going to be as on top of it as the Thessalonians. Now, verse 10, he says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So we are waiting for Jesus Christ to come in the air and take us home to be with him. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord delivered us from the wrath to come. A verse th uh, that goes good with that is Romans 5.9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. I don't have to face the wrath of God in hell 
because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to be on the receiving end of his wrath at the second coming because he died for me and I put my faith in his blood. And I would say I don't have to go through the tribulation because I'm saved from wrath through him and his blood. And a lot of guys believe that the wrath isn't until the last three and a half years of the trib. But I believe the wrath is the entirety of it. And I'm saved from the wrath through Jesus Christ. I don't believe I'm going through any of it. But the biggest reason the Lord is, isn't, is not putting us through any of that future time period is because during that time, he goes back to dealing with Israel. Uh, to, if, if you don't believe that, re read Revelation again. I know you've probably read it many times. And you'll find it's just so Jewish and talking about Israel throughout. I mean, read it and you'll find 144,000 male Jewish virgins taken from the 12 tribes of Israel. And then read Matthew 24 and see how the Lord talks about the Sabbath. Read Jeremiah and see how he calls it the time of Jacob's trouble, which Jacob is Israel. You see, all signs uh, point to Israel during the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And I... The church is not Israel. So that's the biggest reason I don't believe the Lord is, is putting us through that future tribulation time period. So we're, we're, when, I say, when the, uh, Paul says we're delivered from the wrath to come, I believe he means we're delivered from the entirety of the tribulation. We're not under God's wrath right now. I mean, if you're not saved, the wrath of God's abiding on you, according to the Apostle John. And I, I believe, obviously, we're saved from God's wrath in hell. So because of the blood of Jesus, we're saved from all these bad things. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to go through tribulation in this life. I mean, that has nothing to do with the with that future time period. You know, you can face, tri Christians are facing tribulation and persecution right now for the faith. But that has nothing to do with that future time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. Two completely different things. But now chapter 2, look at this verse in chapter 2 in verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Thessalonians were Bible believers. They didn't think it was just the word of men. The word effectually works in those who believe it. And a lot of men get their faith shaken in the words of God. They hear this older man that is their mentor maybe. And maybe he corrects the word of God. And maybe that older man is King James only. But he's just not a King James Bible believer. And they see him and uh, they look up to him. He shakes their faith in the word of God because he wants to go in there and say, uh, I'm, you know, I like the King James, but this word should have really been this or something like that. And they get affected by that. I know guys who prefer the King James over other versions, but they don't believe the Bible is perfect. But the Thessalonians, it's a good church. They didn't believe that it's just the word of men. They believed that what Paul was giving them was the word of God. And I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. I believe it's perfect. Maybe you think you found some errors in it, and you say it isn't perfect but rather just a good translation. Well, that's your opinion. I believe it's the Word of God, all of it. And I hear guys saying the King James is the perfect, infallible, inspired Word of God, and then they point out some places that they think are a poor translation. Well, that doesn't make sense. How is it perfect and, and infallible, inspired Word of God without error and all this, but yet you say there's parts in it that's a poor translation. That doesn't make sense. How is it perfect if, if you can point out places that aren't exactly right? And how do you get to the point where you think you're smart enough to say that something in the Bible is not right? Or to say that you... I mean, how could you just look at another guy and take his word for it that what he's seeing in the Bible is not right? I just don't see how you can come to that conclusion. If you if you pin me down and show me something in the Bible that you think is an error, I'm just going to take it by faith that it's not an error 
and that the problem is with me and you and not with the Bible. That's being a Bible believer, and that's what I believe the Thessalonians were. Now, chapter 3 and verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. There is a day when the Lord will come for his saints, and we're going to meet him in the air. And then there's a day when Jesus comes with his saints, and we're going to come back with him. You see, at the rapture, he comes to get us, and at the second coming, he comes back with us. And in Jude 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. In Revelation 19, 14, it says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Me and you are going to be part of that army that comes back. So when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ coming back with all his saints, that's talking about me and you coming back at the second coming. And now chapter 4, you've got the great chapter on the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So you are a vessel, and it is a mystery why God would dwell in you, but he does. He bought you. He purchased you with his own blood. And now your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This means you need to possess this vessel that you're walking around in, in sanctification and honor. Don't, don't just do the things with your body that the lost man does. Don't join flesh with as many women as you can like the world does. It said this is the will of God for you to possess this vessel, this body, in sanctification and honor. Sanctification means that you're setting yourself apart. The will of God is for you to live right. You know, everybody's always wondering, what's the will of God for my life? Well, this is the start right here. Possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. And everything else will fall into place. Abstain from fornication. The only woman you should lay with is your wife that you have. And if you're not married, then save yourself for your future wife. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Something that will help you possess your vessel in sanctification and honor is to stay busy and stay quiet. Work with your own hands and mind your own business. You see, if you work and you stay busy working with your hands, then you have a lot less time to sin and be a busy body, you see. Now, Paul is going to get into the great verses about the rapture of the church down here in verse 13 of chapter 4, and he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now them which are asleep are not people that's taken a nap. These are people that are dead in Christ. The people, Those that are asleep are the dead in Christ. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. See, the souls of the dead in Christ are going to come with the Lord to meet us in the air. Their bodies will get up out of the graves. They're going to be changed and join with their soul. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So if me and you are alive at the rapture, then we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. Meaning, we're not going to go before them which are dead. We're not going to go up first. The dead in Christ are going to go up first. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You see, they're going to go up first. The Lord himself descends with a shout. The dead in Christ go up first. And you see, here he isn't sending angels to gather the elect like he does in Matthew 24. You see, Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4 are two different events. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 then, we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. At the rapture we meet the Lord in the air, and at his second coming he touches the ground on white horses with us. And that's going to be bloody. That's going to be fighting. 
But here, that's not what you see. That's the difference between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, he's coming to get us. He takes us out of this world. Then the tribulation takes place. And then after that, you got the second coming where he comes back with us. And that's what's being spoken of in Matthew 24, where it says, and immediately after the tribulation of those days. That's when the second coming is going to take place. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Wherefore comfort one another with these words. It is a comfort to know that you've been delivered from the tribulation, the wrath of the second coming, and the lake of fire. It's a comfort to know that you're going to see your loved ones again. Now chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is when Jesus Christ comes back in flaming fire taking vengeance. And he's going to come back with us on a white horse, as described in Revelation 19. And he will set up his kingdom on earth after he slays all the God-haters of this world. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You see, they're going to say peace and safety, because during that future time, the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to come in peaceably, according to Daniel 11:21, And they think he will solve all their problems. And he's going to be the most powerful ruler that ever existed outside of Jesus Christ. And people will have their trust in him. And they'll take this mark and think this mark of the beast are going to, is going to solve things. And at the same time, they're going to worship him. And millions of people will be in his army and think they can defeat Jesus Christ in his army. And they'll put their trust in him. But sudden destruction is going to come upon them. Not only at the second coming of Jesus Christ, but also during the time of the great tribulation itself. God just rains his wrath on them time after time. He compares all this stuff that comes on them as travail upon a woman with child. And he says they shall not escape. You see, there's no place to hide from him during the great tribulation. He even causes the sun to scorch men with great heat. He unleashes devilish locusts on the earth out of a bottomless pit the bottomless pit and you're going to have famines and pestilences and earthquakes and everything else there is trouble going on during the entirety of the tribulation and especially the last three and a half years but they're going to say peace and safety because they've been promised a false peace a false hope they got pe they're going to have people going around saying peace peace when there is no peace and 1 Thessalonians 5 4 says but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You see, we are the children of light. And it's been settled that we're going to be on the winning side in that day. It's not going to catch us off guard. We will be the ones who are like a thief, actually, during that time. And Joel 2 9 says, We enter in at the windows like a thief. The Lord's going to come back like a thief at the second coming. 1 Thessalonians 5 5 through 9. You are all the children of light. And the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are the children of light. And the children of the day. So we need to stay awake. And watch and be sober. A lot of Christians are being put to sleep by the world's stuff. They are so caught up in everything that the things of God have been put on the shelf. But God has not appointed us to wrath. But we need to warn others that his wrath is coming. So that they can be saved and not be appointed to wrath. The rapture hasn't happened yet. But while we wait, we need to, verse 16, rejoice evermore. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice evermore. While you're waiting on the rapture, rejoice evermore. Quit bickering and complaining. Just praise God that you're saved. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. While you wait on the rapture, just pray. This can't mean every second, but throughout the day, constantly talk to God like you would a best friend, a mother, a father. Uh, verse 18, and everything give thanks. While you wait, and everything give thanks. Even when things are bad, remember that it could be worse. 
Verse 19, quench not the spirit. Quench means to extinguish or put it out. Uh, you can't ever lose the Holy Spirit, but you can quench the spirit. The Holy Spirit can be quenched when we choose to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. He can be quenched when we look for comfort in something else, even though he's our comforter. The Holy Spirit can be quenched when we don't want to hear the right preaching. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit th speaks through men to reprove the world of sin. So the next verse says, despise not prophesyings. Don't despise when a preacher gets up and tells you the consequences of your actions. When he tells you that hell is real. When he tells you about the judgment seat of Christ. When he tells you that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. These are all prophecies. So despise not prophesying. Many people think that prophesying is just a man telling you something that God only gave him that isn't even in the Bible. Well, that's not true. That's false prophesying. When I get on here and I tell you about the tribulation, the great white throne and the rapture, all these things, that's prophesying. But the thing is, that stuff's in the Bible. God didn't just give that to me as some advanced revelation that only I came up with, you see. A Christian can get to the point where he doesn't want to hear about these things because he wants to finish his life down here and living the American dream, not having to worry about, you know, the judgment seat of Christ, doesn't want to have to worry about people that might be going to hell that he should be praying for. He just wants to live the American dream down here. And he can get to a point where he despises prophesying, hates listening to the preaching. Verse 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Put everything through the Bible filter. It will get all the dirt and the dust and the clumps and the false doctrine out and everything that is good will come out on the other side clean enough to eat it. That's how you prove all things. Take everything I say. Don't take anything I say and just say, well, it's right because he's uh, done all these studies so he must know what he's talking about. No, Take it and put it through your Bible filter. And then if it ain't right, then trash it. And if it is, hold fast that which is good. Prove all things. Get rid of the junk that ain't no good. Hold fast that which is good. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. There are some things that you can do that aren't evil, but they appear evil. This is something that has to have a balance to it because you just can't take this verse and go overboard with it or you would never do anything. For example, I went to uh, drug addicts' houses to, to give them the gospel and something in my mind said, everyone in your neighborhood knows that these people are druggies. So if you go, they'll think you're getting involved in drugs. That comes to my mind almost every single time. So something in me said, well, that's the appearance of evil. But you can't take it that far or you, you'll never do anything. Uh, some people wouldn't go into a restaurant that serves alcohol because uh, they would think someone is going to accuse them of drinking. Well, I mean, they could, but what about the gas station then? You'd have to quit going to the gas station. How are you going to get gas? What about Walmart and the grocery stores? They sell alcohol. How are you going to get food for your family? I mean, you can only go so far with these things. It's going to get to a point where you become, it could get to a point where you become so just overly separated that you just never do anything. I heard of this one guy who drove miles and miles to, to a gas station because this gas station did not sell alcohol. And it gets to a point where things get unrealistic. And we things have gotten too bad and gone too far that... You can't just be overly separated. Now, I'll tell you something personally I quit doing. Was at this one restaurant. They had these drinks. They were not alcoholic drinks. They were just like fruity drinks with fruit and a nice glass. But someone could easily think I was drinking an alcoholic drink. So I thought to myself, well, I, I just, I'm going to quit drinking these drinks. Plus, now I don't get anything but water when I go out to eat anyway. Because it saves you about eight bucks if you got a family of four if you just get water. But, you know, be, you could be conscious, conscious of these things, but don't go overboard with it. And just because something might appear evil to, to you 
you can't just go judging that person saying they're doing something wrong when they're not. But at the same time, people's going to say stuff about you no matter what. They're going to talk about you no matter what you do, whether you're living right, whether you're living bad. And verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a great verse that shows a person has a spirit, soul, and body. When you die, your body goes to the grave, your soul goes to heaven or hell, and your spirit goes back to God, according to Ecclesiastes 12, 7. When the rich man died in Luke 16, his soul went to hell. His soul looked just like his body. It had a tongue, it had everything. Souls can even wear clothes. If there was a soul and you threw a a, a sheet on it, it looked like a ghost. It looked just like a body. Souls were given white robes in Revelation 6, 11. So it was the rich man's soul in hell. He didn't burn up and cease to exist. I mean, he's still burning to this day. When the Christian dies, though, his soul goes to the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So, your soul, when it dies, it goes to heaven or hell. Your body goes to the grave. Remember in Luke 16, it says the rich man died and was buried, but his soul lifted up its eyes being in torments. So you got a spirit, a soul, and a body. When you get saved, your body is not what gets born again. It's your soul. Your spirit isn't what gets born again. Your Because uh, Paul talks about in Corinthians about cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. So it's your soul that gets saved. It's your soul that gets born again. Remember that your three parts, it's body, soul, spirit. And that can clear up a lot of confusion for you when you're reading the Bible many times. But this has been the overview for 1 Thessalonians.